ancient duped masses! You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Pilato. Portland Militia, Constitution Rewrite, and Saber Guardian. Plus this day in history with Medgar Evers assassinated and our song of the day by Death From Above on Your Morning Monarchy for June 12th, 2017. I'm James Evan Pilato from MediaMonarchy.com. Welcome to wherever you are. Good morning from the best West Coast. Coming to you, as always, from the peak Portland studios up here in Portland, Oregon. We are live, streaming live, a couple seconds after 9 a.m. Pacific time, MediaMonarchy.com slash listen. We strike up the stream about 15 minutes even before your morning monarchy starts. We've been listening to some music, hanging out in the chat with Sebastian and Matt, and huge thanks to everybody hanging out in the Discord chat. You can find the links to that in the tweets, just as you can find every story we are going to talk about right here on the tweets as well. And we are brought to you by you. We are listener-supported media. For nearly 12 years running, we are brought to you by you. MediaMonarchy.com slash support has the links to the Bitcoin, the snail mail, the PayPal, and the Patreon. As I like to say, if you can give a little, I can give a lot, my friends. And a huge thanks to the Truth Seeker app and RadioConfluence.com for carrying and or simulcasting your Media Monarchy broadcasts. Hour in the news in the morning that we call your morning monarchy. Then we have a dedicated music show at noon we call Pump Up the Volume. And it is a new Music Monday. All the other media brought... It's brought to you by you. I don't know. That's all I got to say about it. Hope you're doing well. Hope you had a fantastic and safe weekend. I expected fully to come back here this Monday morning and have all my website woes worked out. Not so fast, buddy. I'm still basically waiting to hear back from the hosting company about the upgrades that need to happen so they can do and update all these other things kind of at their mercy, unfortunately. Fortunately, the site has never been down. Everything's still been up. The website's accessible. The stream's accessible. I just haven't been able to add new content to the website since freaking Wednesday. Now, luckily, we've been putting up all your morning monarchies up on YouTube and up on BitChute. In their entirety, I've even left the songs in as well. Now, not so lucky with your pump up the volume episodes. I can't put up an hour of music on YouTube. I never get away with it. So you got to listen live for your daily DJ set at noon. And we are working. I'm basically waiting for an email. It's like, you know, you've been at jobs before. It's like, well, I put in the work order. I've put in the work order and I'm just waiting for those server upgrades. And again, we are brought to you by you. We're online thanks to you. MediaMonarchy.com slash support. So we're going to get all those server woes fixed out. But rather than halt everything and freak out and bang my keyboard with my head... I'm just going to do what I always do. Make a consistent output of non-commercial media. So if you're struggling, shows up on YouTube, shows up on BitChute. We do it live at 9 a.m. Pacific Time. I replay it at 2 p.m. Pacific Time right on the stream, MediaMonarchy.com slash listen. Well, it's just me and Frank again this week. Cassie had to go out of town this time. Fortunately, it's not for serious family business that's actually for a little bit of work a little bit of work she is here on the first anniversary of the orlando shooting in orlando for a work conference she's doing an av convention over there in orlando so that means it's me and frank by ourselves this week i think we can make it through had a fantastic weekend actually even friday night not one but two old west virginia friends were passing through town so we had a big friday night throwdown which made for sleeping in late a little bit on Saturday. But then on Saturday, I headed out to a little concert. By which I mean a big, giant, massive stadium concert, which I'm not generally a huge fan of. It's actually only the third time I've been in the big stadium here in Portland. It's where the Trailblazers play. But when it's set up for concerts, you can get about 15, 16,000 people in there. I went to go see Tesla, Poison, and Def Leppard. Holy shit, it was in Oregon in 2017, but it kind of felt like West Virginia in 1987, in, in, in a good way. I tweeted up some clips with, of course, my fantastic seats I had. I think, my, I think I've gotten a bleeding out of my nose. So that's C.C. DeVille raging on the guitar there. Tesla opened up, then Def Leppard headlined. And you can get those clips. Got Rick Allen's drum solo. It was a fantastic time. I had to go, you know, for the kid in me. And I could talk about these shows a bunch. I actually, I've 
They're all obviously legitimately thankful to each other and to the fans. So I'll maybe geek out about that a little bit later. Oh, God, Poison did do a whole, all right, everybody, let's get out your phones and sing something to believe in for our fighting men and women overseas, fighting for our freedom to party. Yes, that is exactly what he said. So all that aside, I did have a good time. All the while, this was happening outside. Portland police successfully talked down a man in an apparent mental health crisis who had climbed on top of a TriMet bus with a pair of scissors at the busy Rose Quarter Transit Center. Officers with the police's bureau's enhanced crisis intervention team negotiated with the man for nearly three hours before he climbed down a ladder, put up against the bus for him, and walked to a waiting ambulance. The incident blocked Max's red, green, and blue line trains, and buses were rerouted in the area. It unfolded as a Portland Timbers match at Providence Park at soccer, then a Moda Center concert headlined by Def Leppard let out. Portland's seemingly getting crazier by the moment. God, I was just even having a couple slices of pizza the other day and just reading through the local city paper, which I'm not a giant fan of. And it's the, Bo- <laughs> it's the Portland burrito thing. About Remember the story we talked about? The white women stealing all the burrito ideas. That story. We've got the Jeremy Christian racist Zodiac shirt wearing murder on the max. And I've got a really strange story. I actually had to share it with my buddy Lauren Coleman. He's already commented on it on the tweets. I mentioned about the guy who stole the victim's backpack and wedding ring, and they actually did catch the guy. Fascinating story coming out about that guy and what he used to be. He used to be a hero rather than a villain. It's a strange story that I could only really file under holy hexes, so we'll talk about that this Thursday. Each day of your morning monarchy, we tend to focus in on a different area of the news. Friday is the entertainment industrial complex we call media memes. Thursday is dark and disturbing we call holy hexes. Wednesday is food, health, and environment news we call food, world order. Tuesday's tech, that's cyberspace war, but right here, right now, it is Monday, it is world news, and we call it geopolitics. All the tweets, all the hashtags, you can find all the stuff all on the sites. But let me pop back and hit you with some breaking lamestream news before we head on into more Portland news. Jeffrey Immelt to retire as General Electric Chief. Maryland and D.C. sue Trump over his private businesses. And the Bill Cosby trial shocker just broke a little bit ago. Defense rests after six minutes. Dr. Dr. Huxtable will not be taking the stand. So let's whip back around as we went from Poison and Def Leppard to Crazy Scissor Man on top of the bus to this. The U.S. Attorney's Office is investigating an arrest conducted by federal law enforcement officers at a pro-Trump free speech rally in Portland. Now remember, this is the same place, this is the same rally that the mayor was basically asking the feds to cancel the permit because the feds own the Terry Shrunk Plaza here in Portland. The investigation was initiated in part by photos Oregon Public Broadcasting documented that show two private citizens assisting officers in detaining and arresting a counter-protester. One of those people identified as Vancouver, Washington resident Tositala Tiny Tose grabbed the protester and threw him to the ground. According to the Willamette Week, Tose has physically assaulted protesters before. The second person identified as Todd Kelsey then assisted three Federal Protective Service officers in restraining and handcuffing the protester. Kelsey is an Army veteran, of course, who said he has law enforcement training through corrections. He's also a member of a 3% militia-style group. And they spell three with the Roman numerals, I-I-I percent, militia-style group. Those photos of Kelsey and Tos have sparked criticism from left-wing groups who say local and federal law enforcement should have stopped the two men from participating in the arrest. Lucy Martinez, spokesperson for the Department of Homeland Security, told OPB in an email that FPS officers were operating within the scope of their authorities when they carried out the citizen-assisted arrest. While the officers appear to have acted within the law, law enforcement agencies on hand had agreed before the rally to limit the involvement of self-described private security 
who said they were invited by Republican Party members. My understanding is that event organizers were asked to make sure that private security would not interfere in any arrest scenario, Portland Police Bureau spokesman Sergeant Pete Simpson told the OPB in an email. FPS corroborated Simpson's statement in an interview a couple of days ago. There was a number of agreements put into place between all the law enforcement agencies, the Multnomah County Sheriff's Department, the State Police, FPS, and the Portland Police Bureau to make sure that we're all operating on the same sheet of paper so that we're all running our operations the same way. Now, OPB's Brian Vance spoke with Kelsey, a member of a self-described patriot group. And now there's a back and forth and there's the entire transcript, but the takeaway, as is the popular saying, man confirms, and that's Todd Kelsey, officers asked him for help in arresting the protester. Now, this is the interesting little tie-ins that I get from my friends and associates who work in and around the city. The Portland police has been very open, and especially since the murders on the Max. They've been very open, actually, about citizens assisting their work. And they've got the photo. And you can see the guy. You can see he's got his mostly police gear on. But it sort of reminds me of those old photos. I forget which place it was. It was as we were constantly watching for the protests and the drills and the provocateurs. Was it in Canada? It was one of those places where you could basically tell the cops were embedded within the protesters. Because you're looking like, look at the boots. Their boots are exactly the same as the cops. You could look at this guy and it's like, hey, he pretty much looks like a cop. His gear's just a little less. So this is going to cause more sticky situations here in town. Because, of course, the fake left is losing their minds over the fake right. And everybody's got their little costumes and everybody's playing the part. And the play is called Let's Prop Up the System. Man confirms officers asked for his help in arresting Portland protester. And as I was going to say, the police are very open about having the public assist them. You're listening to The Morning Monarchy for Monday, June 12th, 2017. I'm James Evan Pilato from MediaMonarchy.com. Coming to you from Media Monarchy Studios, streaming live at MediaMonarchy.com slash listen. It is Monday, that's world news, so let's pull back our focus for a bit more of a macrocosm all around the world as we follow the developing updates. There have already been a number of questions raised following the London Bridge attacks, just as there were following Parliament Square, the Westminster Bridge attacks, and even more recently, the Manchester Arena attacks. It's important to note the common thread between each suspicious event and the last three UK attacks are no exception, as there's now indisputable evidence linking the MI5 and MI6, essentially Britain's FBI, CIA. MI5 is kind of like the FBI. MI6 is kind of like the CIA. One's supposed to work domestically, the other internationally. Evidence linking MI5 and MI6 British security services to various individuals prior to carrying out the terror crimes mentioned above. The London Bridge attack is the third such incident occurring in the UK over the past three months and now subsequently the third in a row that has shown prior knowledge of attackers before a high-profile act of terror was committed. After law enforcement purposely withheld sensitive information concerning the identity of the London Bridge attackers, two of the three have now been officially named. It turns out, as suggested, and we're grabbing this story from 21st Century Wire, that at least one suspect, 27-year-old Karam Butt, B-U-T-T, was already quite well known to MI5 and police and had been under investigation over the past two years. Butt's 30-year-old accomplice, Rashid Rudain, a chef by trade, a.k.a. Rashid Elkdar, was apparently not known to authorities. A little bit of an update to this story from 21st Century Wire. According to the UK's Telegraph, Rudain was known to authorities and he reportedly participated in the NATO-backed regime change operation in, of course, Libya, and was an avid follower of Anjim Chowdhury's and Omar Bakri Mohammed's banned terror group al Muhajron. al Muhajron. The counterintelligence waters run deep in the group, as the terror tied group's founders and members have direct ties to the MI5. It was also claimed that Rudan fought in the Libyan revolution against Gaddafi and joined a militia, there's a militia again, which went on to send jihadist fighters to Syria. 
Libyan security and diplomatic sources said he traveled to the North African country in 2011 and then returned in recent years while living in Ireland and the UK. Authorities in the country said they were urgently checking whether he could have come in contact with Salman Abedi, the Manchester bomber, allegedly, who also regularly traveled to Libya. The new revelations arrive after reports linked the MI5 known suspect but to a Channel 4 documentary, The Jihadist Next Door in the UK, something included in 21st Century Wire's last report. This whole aspect of the case is reminiscent of the Orlando shooting saga, where the apparent Pulse nightclub shooter Omar Mateen was found to have worked with Homeland Security and G-Force, G-4S, while also appearing in two high-profile documentaries. After playing a role in the Hollywood documentary about the BP oil spill at Deepwater Horizon, The Big Fix, Mateen was also found to have been featured in another documentary called Love City Jalalabad, a picture that appeared to depict progressive Afghani youth and a quest for social change. So what are the chances that another well-known wolf terrorist would be involved in a well-produced documentary? There have been other strange links to the London Bridge attacks as well. Interestingly, the excuse being peddled by the Metropolitan Police Assistant Commissioner Mark Rowley is that after a two-year investigation into Butts' activities, there was no evidence of an attack plan, even though the alleged ringleader, handler, of the London Bridge attacks didn't bother to hide his links to al Muhajrun, the band terror-linked organization with ties to British intelligence, as previously mentioned. This stuff happens like clockwork. Two London Bridge attackers named, one known already to MI5, another found dead, fortunately, with ID. London's Metropolitan Police have named two of the men who allegedly killed seven people and injured dozens more near London Bridge late on Saturday. Detectives have also revealed that one of them was previously known to police and Britain's domestic security service, MI5. 27-year-old Kuram Shahzad Butt, seen here on the left, was a Pakistani-born British citizen. The second assailant has been named as 30-year-old Rashid Redouan, who is also known as Rashid el Qadar. He reportedly claimed to be Moroccan and Libyan. Both men lived in the same area of East London, where police made a number of arrests on Monday morning adding to the 12 detained following raids in Barking over the weekend. As the investigation continues to establish the identity of the third attacker, London's Mayor Sadiq Khan led a vigil in honour of the victims. London stands in defiance against this cowardly attack on our city, our people, our values and our way of life. As the Mayor of London I want to send a clear message to the sick and evil extremists who commit these hideous crimes. We will defeat you. You will not win. Officials say 36 people remain in hospital with 18 critically ill. We will just cut off your funding. How about that? Then you guys won't be able to do it. Now, these attacks are a lot of things. But cowardly, it ain't. Now, I know that's what got Bill Maher fired from his Disney job a decade plus ago. You can say a lot of things. I don't think cowardly is the word for it. Dastardly, terrible, evil, violent, horrible. It takes a hell of a lot of guts crazy, insane, extremist guts. So as long as we're looking at the UK, let's quickly glance at the continuing fallout from general election 2017. There have been calls for Theresa May to step down. There's the possibility that Jeremy Corbyn might suddenly become the prime minister. But really, most interesting are the 249 votes that Buckethead got. Here is Maidenhead, there is the Prime Minister on the left, and we'll hear the result of the Maidenhead vote. No risk of her losing this seat, but certainly risk to her political future and the results of the coming in. Look at the array of candidates there. Stay with us while we just hear how each of them has done. Batten, Gerard, Joseph, UK Independence Party, 
Halamer Yamasak, known as Yemi Halameri, independent, 16. Harvey Jonathan David, known as Lord Buckethead, 249. Hill, Hill. Now he's the only one who actually gets those hoots and hollers. Lord Buckethead set a new record 249 votes in that general election. Pretty easy decision to make the cover art today. Lord Buckethead in his giant black Darth Vader outfit and a, what appears to be a large cylindrical bucket on his head. Standing right next to Theresa May and all the rest of the goofs. So good. Now, I first learned about Lord Buckethead from our buddy Darren over in Liverpool. What I had to let him know and what I'll let you know right here, because here in the States, we're like, what, Buck Buckethead? No, not our Buckethead. We have a Buckethead here in the States. He's, he's not a lord. And I don't believe he's ever tried to run for any elected office. He is a wicked musician and guitar player. He was even a member of Guns N' Roses for a short time. How many bucket heads can there be? Are they the way of the future? That's the suggestion over in the chat. And again, we appreciate you joining us live in the Discord chat and joining us live for our stream. You're listening to The Morning Monarchy for Monday, June 12, 2017. I'm James Evan Pilato for MediaMonarchy.com in a piece for the Just Security blog published on June 5th about the impact of Western, or rather, weapons industry contributions on a Saudi arms vote. Ryan Goodman notes that money also pollutes other policy spaces that influence congressional votes, including the news media. In March of this year, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee invited former Ambassador Gerald Feierstein, director of the Center for Gulf Affairs at the Middle East Institute, to speak about the situation in Yemen and about his views on the sale of U.S. arms to the Saudis. As one might have anticipated from his interview in the Washington Post, Feierstein told the committee, quote, accusations of war crimes leveled against Saudi and coalition armed forces and threats to end arms sales to the Saudis have the potential to inflict long-lasting damage to these relationships. Limiting the supply of munitions would be counterproductive, and I don't understand why if you're so concerned about Saudi actions causing collateral damage, you would limit the ability of them to acquire the kinds of weapons that would limit collateral damage and would allow them to be more accurate. It's, I find vaguely interesting and important. Let's read that again, shall we? I don't understand why, if you're concerned about Saudi actions causing collateral damage, you would limit the ability of them to acquire the kinds of weapons that would limit collateral damage and would allow them to be more accurate. The answer is that you may be concerned that the Saudis would use those more accurate weapons to target civilians, funeral homes, and other objects on a no-strike list. Weddings and such. Never disclosed in the Washington Compost interview or in the Senate hearing was the source of funding for Firestein's Middle East Institute. According to its most recent public report, the Institute counts among its chief donors, leading members of the Saudi-led coalition in Yemen and major arms manufacturers. Saudi Arabia and Kuwait provide the highest level of support as platinum sponsors. And the UAE is also a donor. Raytheon, the manufacturer of the very weapons at issue in the Senate hearing, is a gold sponsor of the Institute. I guess these must be the levels of pledges. Are they, are they on Patreon? It's worth noting for us that the Middle East Institute is not unique in Washington. The defense industry and foreign governments pump money into many think tanks. But the conflicts of interest posed by think tank funding are a pretty endemic problem in establishment journalism, which often presents industry-funded institutes as neutral reports. Neutral experts. For a recent example, you can see back in May on FAIR, Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting, Lockheed Martin-funded experts agree South Korea needs more Lockheed Martin missiles. So there's way more proof you can't trust the Washington Post's foreign policy reporting. There's even a related story here from the anti-media, the CIA, Washington Post, and Russia. What you're not being told. CIA has deep, deep, long connections to the Washington Post. And the old Graham family and the Bilderbergs and the powers that shouldn't be. They've just got goosed with a little bit of action and they suddenly feel very important post-America's next top president. 
Now, a little addendum I will include in this and not really go into it is one on Zero Hedge. Forget terrorism. The real reason behind the Qatar crisis is natural gas. That possibility still exists. And let's go from the Washington Compost to the old gray lady. Special report by Robert Perry up on Consortium News. An MIT national security scientist says the New York Times pushed a fraudulent analysis of last April's sarin incident in Syria. For U.S. mainstream journalists and government analysts, their erroneous group thinks often have a shady accomplice called confirmation bias, that is, the expectation that some enemy must be guilty and thus the tendency to twist any fact in that direction. We've seen this pair contribute to fallacious reasoning more and more in recent years as corporate U.S. mainstream media and the U.S. government approach international conflicts as if the pro-U.S. side is surely innocent and the anti-U.S. side is presumed guilty. That was the case in assessing whether Iraq was hiding weapons of mass destruction in 2002 and 3. It was repeatedly regarded as an alleged chemical weapons attack in Syria during that six-year conflict, and it surfaces as well in the new Cold War in which Russia is always the villain. The trend also requires insulting any Western journalist or analyst who deviates from the group thinks or the questions about confirmation bias. The dissidents are often called stooges, apologists, conspiracy theorists, or, of course, purveyors of fake news. So in a little-noticed May 29, 2017 report on the April 4th chemical weapons incident at Khan Sheikhoun in northern Syria, Postal, that's Theodore Postal, professor of science, technology, and national security policy at MIT. Postal takes apart the blame the Syrian government conclusions of the New York Times, Human Rights Watch, and the establishment's favorite internet site, Bellingcat. Postal's analysis focused on a New York Times video report entitled How Syria and Russia Spun a Chemical Strike, which followed Bellingcat research that was derived from social media. Theodore Postal concluded that none of the forensic evidence in the New York Times video and a follow-up Times News article supports the conclusions reported by the New York Times. The basic weakness of the New York Times Bellingcat analysis was the reliance on social media from the Al-Qaeda-controlled area of Idlib province, and thus a dependence on evidence from the jihadists and their civil defense collaborators, you know them, you hate them, the White Helmets. The jihadists and their media team have become very sophisticated in the production of propaganda videos that are distributed through social media and credulously picked up by major Western news outlets. A Netflix infomercial for the White Helmets even won an Academy Award earlier this year, as if you need any more reason to stop going to horrible propaganda movies. I mean, how many CIA movies are there? What, we just talked about the upcoming American Made on Friday's episode of Your Morning Monarchy. So all of this erroneous reporting and finger-pointing, of course, led America's next top president to follow in the footsteps of his previous puppets. And that would be to launch a bunch of missiles and kill a bunch of people, because that's what they do. I don't care if they have a D after the name or an R after their name. They continue the crimes of their previous puppets. Let's continue to look around the world here on your Morning Monarchy as U.S. Special Forces have now joined the battle to crush Islamist militants holed up in a southern Philippines town, officials said on Saturday as government forces struggled to make headway and 13 Marines were killed in intense urban fighting. The Philippines military said the United States was providing technical assistance to end the siege of Marari City by fighters allied to Islamic State, which is now in its third week, but it had no boots on the ground. So how many wars are that? Is that, is that eight? Is that eight open wars now? I mean, Bush only really started two. I mean, he got the kickstart of all of it, as all of this is predicated on 9-11. You want to stop Trump? Investigate 9-11. You want to stop Trump? Investigate the abuses of power that everyone rushed to hand all the previous puppet presidents. All those great things that you gave Obama are now fantastic tools being wielded by America's next top president. Nine wars if we count Sudan, according to the chat. Good lord. But don't worry, guys. They're not fighting. They're just providing technical support. The presence of the U.S. counterparts facilitate the exchanges of uh, 
intelligence, facilitate subject matter experts exchange, and also provides uh, training exchanges and of course uh, the technical support that we are sharing together in the fight of global terrorism. Good God. So that's uh, military spokesman Lieutenant Colonel Joe R. Herrera talking to a news conference in Morari City. The Pentagon, which has no permanent presence in the Philippines, but for years has kept 50 to 100 Special Forces troops in the south of the country on rotational exercises, confirmed it was helping the Philippine military in Morari. So let's read that fantastic Reuters sentence again. The Pentagon has no permanent presence, but keeps 100 Special Forces troops in the country. Um, all, all the time, so that you would call that maybe a permanent. Oh, no, they're rotational exercises, but there's always troops, always troops there, yeah? Okay, so that sounds like a bunch of military doublespeak. Let's go from the Philippines over to Venezuela again, as Venezuela's chief prosecutor called last Thursday for Venezuelans to reject President Nicolas Maduro's push to rewrite the nation's constitution. That's always what leaders like to do. So just as I was talking about here in the States, more and more and more and more power continues to funnel to who we used to call the unitary executive, the decider-in-chief, if you will. But Venezuela's chief prosecutor not only called for them to reject the rewrite of the Constitution, but urged the Supreme Court to annul the process immediately, further deepening the divide with the government. Grasping a copy of the nation's blue constitution book in her hands on the steps of the Supreme Court, Luisa Ortega Diaz said she was acting to defend both the embattled nation's constitution and its very democracy. What's at play here, she said, is the integrity of Venezuelans. According to a survey, Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro's plan to rewrite the constitution is opposed by 85% of the country's citizens. In the poll, the majority of respondents agreed with the statement, there is no need to change the current constitution the government should do is enforce it. Maduro has called an election for July 30th to choose lawmakers who will work on the new constitution. He has called it a way to bring back peace after two months of anti-government conflict. Opposition parties say they will not participate in the election. Ortega Diaz's remarks were her strongest repudiation yet of Maduro's efforts to rewrite the nation's constitution. An act she said would destroy the legacy of late President Hugo Chavez, who drafted the current charter. A longtime government loyalist, Ortega Diaz, first broke publicly with the Maduro administration in late March when she decried a Supreme Court decision gutting Congress of its last remaining powers. Since then, the gulf between or Ortega Diaz and the government has only grown, which has repeatedly questioned the validity of convoking a convoking a constitutional assembly without the proposal first facing a referendum. Do all these things do any of these things sound vaguely familiar? This is how tyrannical societies go. This is what happens when good quote-unquote people abdicate the responsibility they're supposed to have because they've been scared to death by terror. Terror has been very successful these last nearly 16 years. We go from the Philippines to Venezuela. Let's hop back now to Libya with a potentially giant development. Saif al-Islam Gaddafi, son of former Libyan leader Muammar Gaddafi, has been released from prison, according to the militia that has held him for five years. Gaddafi was reportedly freed by the Abu Bakr al-Sadiq Battalion Militia, which controls areas of Zintan, that's southwest of the capital of Tripoli. Gaddafi was captured in Zintan in November 2011, a month after his father was sodomized and killed by rebels. Gaddafi's son had been attempting to flee to Niger at the time of his capture. He was sentenced to death in 2015 during a mass trial of former Gaddafi officials in Tripoli. The battalion militia released a statement saying he was freed last Friday. The Libya Herald reports the release was in response to the Tobruk-based House of Representatives Amnesty for Political Prisoners. Saif al-Islam Gaddafi was the most prominent of Gaddafi's eight children. He studied at... London School of Economics. Not the least of which is people like Mick Jagger went there as well. So interestingly enough, look at that. Western education. 
Looks like Gaddafi's son is probably tipped for a bright, shining future in Libya, my friends. Let's clean up some of the mess from recently. As it's noted that Judicial Watch, their final lawsuit, going back to, way back to the Obama years. Well, cast your mind back if you can. While Obama was president, the Treasury Department negotiated with Iran to have several American prisoners released. After they were set free, the U.S. government then sent millions to Iran, leading some to believe the money was payment for letting the American prisoners go. Which opens up a whole sticky area. According to reports, Tom Fitton, president of Judicial Watch, government watchdog organization, filing a lawsuit, says they hope to learn as much as possible about the potentially illegal exchange. The Trump administration's agencies should follow the law and release all they can about the Obama-Iran payoff scandal. Noting that the Obama administration's secretive $400 million payoff to the Iranian regime was an abuse of power, ooh, and it might, might have been illegal. Now, we got the last few headlines here on your geopolitics news. And again, everything we say and play always included in the show notes. All the links, all the stories, all the audio, all the video. We've been cleaning up on the developments of the last couple of days and even just kind of catching up over the weekend. But let's look forward to July. And by look forward, I don't mean excitedly. I mean, let's get ahead. The largest U.S.-led drills in the Black Sea area this year will see 25,000 American and Allied troops gather in Bulgaria, Hungary, and Romania this July for the annual Sabre Guardian exercises. The fifth edition of the annual Sabre Guardian War Games, Sabre Guardian 2017, scheduled for July 10th through the 20th, will be larger in both st- scale and scope than Compared to previous years, the U.S. European Command has said in a statement, it'll amass around 25,000 servicemen from the U.S. and 23 other nations, making it the largest of the 18 Black Sea region exercises this year. According to the U.S. European Command, the drills will focus on participant deterrence capabilities, specifically the ability to mass forces at any given time anywhere in Europe. Global Domination The participating forces will also engage in an array of live fire exercises, river crossings, and of course, the always popular mass casualty exercise. So put that on your calendar as you're watching news developments. Sabre Guardian War Games in the Black Sea, July 10th through the 20th. And as we wonder about all these things, of course, I often say, past is prologue. We need the background. I had a listener reach out to me who asked if I'd include an article of his that actually goes back two years, but it's still very pertinent to this day. All of these situations, whether we're talking about right here in the States or talking about in the UK and the intelligence agencies and so-called terrorists. I want you to check out a piece from Gavin Nascimento. It's on a new kind of human.com, and it is the unadulterated truth, a brief factual account of hidden history in our time, Operation Gladio, and the historical evidence of homegrown terrorism. All kinds of fantastic work put together, including the work from our friends Sibel Edmonds and James, James Corbett, Michael Springman, and others. That's a real good bit of background for all of this. Now, our last couple of geopolitics headlines hopefully will set the stage as a transition into our Tuesday show. That's where we talk tech news, cyberspace war. Senator Tom Cotton, Republican from Arkansas, introduced legislation to make permanent Section 702 and other components of the Title VII of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, along with a whole other group of Republican senators. That's Tom Cotton introducing a bill to make FISA Section 702, permanent. A new bill in the Senate uh, that has uh, significant support, stated support from the Trump administration, uh, could theoretically make permanent a controversial section of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act uh, that has good cause to be controversial. The bill would permanently reauthorize a section of FISA that permits the government to spy on Americans who are in contact with foreigners. The act is currently set to expire at the end of the year. So uh, basically, this is a section where 
It says you can't you can't spy under this on an American talking with an American, but if you are communicating in one of many different formats with someone uh, living abroad, a foreign citizen, then they can suck that up. It could be phone calls, it could be emails, it could be text messages, it could be all sorts of things. And what's incredibly important about this is the government has defended a lot of uh, surveillance in the past saying it's just metadata. Why are you getting your panties in a wad over it? In this case, we're talking about the literal content of communications, which means that theoretically, in many cases without warrant, if you're talking on the phone with someone, if you're sending an email to someone living abroad, they can have the full content and details of that communications, and they could, under this bill, have it for the rest of time. There you go. In perpetuity throughout the universe, as contracts often say. Now, I don't know if it's worth getting in touch with your Congress critters. A lot of these things seem to be done deals, and just as we've seen in the other countries we've just discussed in the last 40 minutes, the ones who are supposed to be the ones making the rules obviously abdicated their responsibility a long time ago. I don't know if it's because most of them are blackmailed. They need all that filthy lucre coming back to their poor, beleaguered towns. Well, I need all that pork. I need all that money. And we know it's used against us. They've always been lying about all this stuff. It just seems so ridiculous. But this is another effort to make legal what is obviously not. And they sort of retroactively make these things happen. Oh, yeah, all that spying, all that lying. I, I made a law that says it's not spying, it's not lying. Now, finally, in the perfect transition from geopolitics to cyberspace war. And again, huge thanks to everybody hanging out in the Discord chat where we can continue to discuss, you know, that it's just metadata and PRISM and the rest of it. I think a perfect transition from geopolitics to cyberspace war is our final story today. In her first interview since being released from prison, Whistleblower said she felt responsibility to the public. Chelsea Manning has given her first interview since being released from prison last month in which she explains her motivations for making public thousands of military documents. Excerpts of her interview with Disney's ABC's Nightline co-anchor Juju Chang aired Friday on the network's Good Morning America. Asked about why she leaked the trove of documents, she said, I have a responsibility to the public. We all have a responsibility. We're getting all this information from all these different sources and it's just death, destruction, and mayhem. We're filtering it we're filtering it all through facts, statistics, reports, dates, times, locations, and eventually you just stop. I stopped seeing statistics and information, and I started seeing people. Asked by Hing what she would tell President Obama, Manning, choking up, says, I've been given a chance. That's all I asked for was a chance. To that ABC News exclusive interview with Chelsea Manning, convicted in the largest leak of classified information in U.S. history. After seven years behind bars, how does the transgender soldier see what she did and what will happen to her now? Here's Nightline anchor Juju Chang. Tonight, Chelsea Manning, convicted of the largest leak of documents in U.S. history, speaking out in her first TV interview since her release from prison. So many people call you a traitor. Many call you a hero. Right. Who is Chelsea Manning? So, I'm just me. It's as simple as that. But her journey, far from simple. Back in 2010, then known as Bradley Manning, she was charged with leaking more than 700,000 documents, many of them classified. One could argue you took an oath to defend the Constitution against enemies. Right. Do you feel like you betrayed that oath? No, I think I, st I, think I, stuck, I stuck to it. Manning says she turned to WikiLeaks after seeing images like this. U.S. soldiers opening fire on what ended up being civilians. Oh yeah, look at that, right through the windshield. Uh, including children. Oh, it's their fault for bringing their kids to a battle. That's right. I stopped seeing just statistics and information, and I started seeing people. Counterinsurgency warfare is not a simple thing. There's not, there's no, it's not as simple as like good guys versus bad guys. It is a mess. But critics say she betrayed her country and should have taken her concerns up the chain of command. There are those who say you, uh, you may have been motivated to get the information into the public sphere, but you might have also given it to our enemies. Right, but I have a responsibility to the public. Do you feel as though you owe the American public an apology? I've accepted responsibility. I, I, anything I've done, it's, it's me. In a controversial move, President Obama commuted Manning's 35-year sentence just days before leaving office. I feel very comfortable that 
justice has been served. You haven't spoken to President Obama. What would you say to him if you could? Thank you. I've given a chance. That's all I wanted. You wanted a chance. That's all I asked for was a chance. That's it. And this is my chance. And Juju joins us now from Los Angeles. Clearly, Chelsea Manning is quite emotional about her chance for a new start. But Juju, she was also stunned when she was granted clemency. Absolutely, Tom. Chelsea and her lawyers were shocked. She was looking at another 28 years in a military prison, and yet she had already served more time than any leaker in U.S. history. And now she has that chance, that chance to live freely, but also to speak out on the issues she cares so much about, everything from transgender rights to protecting whistleblowers and now even prison reform. Well, we're all taking it up the chain of command. There you have it, your geopolitics headlines. It's also worth noting that part of Chelsea's leaks were collateral murder. Those were featured on Media Monarchy many, many, many years ago. That's where they killed Reuters journalists and killed little kids. And you can hear those murderers gleefully talking about it. Well, that's why you don't bring a knife to a gunfight. I know there's also breaking news about Puerto Rico voting to be the 51st state now, which is just silly because we all know from Obama that there's already like 57, 58 states. We'll have to do some follow up on that later. And again, we're not only crowdfunded, we are crowdsourced. We get so much of our news from you. Each day of the week of your morning show has a particular hashtag. That's what I track and that's how I put together these shows. If you've got world news, hashtag geopolitics spelled with a K. That's how we do it. We're going to go out with brand new music from a little band called Death From Above. They have finally shed the 1979 part from the end of their name. Thanks to the highly overrated James Murphy, they are back to just being Death From Above. Freeze me from Death From Above coming up in just a few minutes. But first, let's take the always important stroll down this day in history. June 12th, 1429. As part of the Hundred Years' War on this day, Joan of Arc leads the French army in their capture of the city and the English commander, William de la Pole, the first Duke of Suffolk in the second day of the Battle of Jargo. June 12th, 1864. Ulysses S. Grant gives the Confederate forces under Robert E. Lee a victory when he pulls his Union troops from their position at Cold Harbor, Virginia and moves south. June 12th, 1935, at the age of 17, Ella Fitzgerald recorded her very first songs on this day, Love and Kisses and I'll Chase Away the Blues. On this day, June 12th, 1963, in his driveway outside his home in Jackson, Mississippi, African-American civil rights leader Medgar Evers is shot to death by white supremacist Byron de la Beckwith. Angry white supremacists sent death threats to Evers, hoping that fear and intimidation would curb his efforts to integrate the South. But Evers had fought too hard to stop now. The tides were changing, and Evers was proud to be leading the cause. However, Medgar's efforts came to a violent conclusion. On June 12, 1963, as Evers was returning home from an NAACP meeting, KKK member Byron De La Beckwith shot Evers in his driveway as he was getting out of his car. Evers was killed instantly. Arrested for the crime, Byron De La Beckwith was tried twice by all-white juries in 1964. Both trials ended with hung juries. In 1994, new evidence from one of Beckwith's prison guards brought him back to the courts for a third and final time. The guard claimed Beckwith bragged about shooting Evers. Convicted after only six hours by a mixed-race jury, Beckwith got life in prison. Although only living a short 38 years, Evers' legacy has lived on through the struggle for equal rights. Outrage over his death increased the power of the movement in Washington, eventually leading to the creation of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. His wife, Murley, has worked writing books and setting up memorials so that blacks and whites alike will remember his poignant motto, violence is not the way. NAACP Field Secretary Medgar Evers murdered in front of his home in Jackson, Mississippi by Ku Klux Klan member Byron De La Beckwith during the Civil Rights Movement on this day, June 12, 1963. 
June 12, 1964, anti-apartheid activist Nelson Mandela sentenced to life in prison for sabotage in South Africa. June 12, 1967, the United States Supreme Court in Loving versus Virginia declares all U.S. state laws which prohibit interracial marriage to be unconstitutional. June 12, 1987, at the Brandenburg Gate, actor and president Ronald Reagan publicly challenges Mikhail Gorbachev to tear down this wall. June 12, 1994, Nicole Brown Simpson and Ronald Goldman are murdered outside Simpson's home in Los Angeles. Her estranged husband, O.J. Simpson, is later charged with the murders, but is acquitted by a jury. June 12, 2015, in Gothenburg, Sweden, Dave Grohl falls off the stage and breaks his leg. He had his leg set backstage and returned to perform more songs. And yes, one year ago today, June 12, 2016, 49 are killed, 53 injured in an attack on a gay nightclub in Orlando, Florida. The gunman, the aforementioned documentary star, Homeland Security G-Force associate Omar Mateen, was allegedly killed in a gunfight with police. Published to my own website a decade ago today, it was quite a busy day, just as it seems to this very day, and that's always, I think, what's important to remember, why I think it's so important to do these, these looks at history. You might feel like everything is crazy, insane, and it's never been this bad or serious before. This has all been going on for quite some time. Published to my own website a decade ago today, three guardsmen charged with human smuggling, Shin Bet involved in 1976 hijacking, military exercise to include Oregon hams, radio, CNN's fake news story about Ron Paul flying first class. Now, we weren't banding about the phrase fake news. I've just kind of altered my old 10-year-old headline to make it a little more up for today. In their continuing smears of Ron Paul, they were trying to run stories saying, Oh, look, he's flying first class. He's not a small guy. He's a liar. But of course, as it turns out, the Clinton News Network are the liars. D.C. schools hold mock shooting at rampage drills. Also published on my website 10 years ago today, UK troops on trigger-happy drugs. They're being prescribed a controversial drug, which has been blamed for making U.S. pilots trigger-happy and causing friendly fire deaths. Vaccines go to court for links to autism. That from the New York Times. Joint U.S.-Israeli military exercises begin. And from the BBC, Google ranked worst on privacy. All those stories published to MediaMonarchy.com a decade ago today. Celebrating birthdays on June 12th. Born on this day in 1899, Ukrainian-American photographer and journalist called himself Ouija was born on this day. W-E-E-G-E-E. -E -E -E. I first became familiar with his work when they used this giant photograph of his as the cover for George Michael's Listen Without Prejudice, Volume 1. It's that huge shot of all those people on the beach. And that's actually a crop-down version. It's an even larger photo. It's pretty impressive. Also born on this day, June 12th, 1915, David Rockefeller, American banker and businessman. Of course, RIP'd just a couple weeks ago. Irwin Allen was born on this day. He produced and directed all kinds of big 70s and 60s disaster movies, not the least of which, like Towering Inferno. It's also Samuel Z. Arkoff's birthday today, another legendary film guy. Now here's an interesting one. June 12th, 1924, American lieutenant and politician and 41st president of the United States, George Herbert Walker Bush, born on this day. You know what I say about men and their birthdays. <clears throat> June 12, 1928, Vic Damone was born on this day. Holy moly, he's still kicking it. And I believe I saw as I was tooling through this day in history notes, on one of these birthdays, she got a diary. Anne Frank was born on this day in 1929. It's also Jim Neighbors' birthday. Jim Neighbors is way cool. Novelist Rona Jaffe was born on this day. I didn't know she wrote Mazes and Monsters which kind of tied in with the whole 80s satanic panic thing, and they made a terrible movie out of it, starring future CIA cutout Tom Hanks. It's Marv Albert's birthday, Chick Corea's birthday, Bunny Carlos, former Cheap Trick drummer, Junior Brown's birthday, 
It's also Pete Farnan's birthday. He was original bass player in Blonde, or rather in The Pretenders, sorry. It's also Timothy Busfield's birthday. You might know him as the director and others from 30-something, but he also played the electric violin in Revenge of the Nerds. Meredith Bitch Brooks' birthday today, Scott Thompson from Kids in the Hall, Bobby Sheehan, late bass player from Blues Traveler. It's also Jason Mew's birthday, you know him as Jay from Clerks, Kenny Wayne Shepherd, Robin, that's Robin with a Y out of Sweden, born on this day, and finally, Dirt Bombs drummer Ben Blackwell. I don't know if any of those folks will make it into our daily DJ set at noon because it is a new Music Monday, and to wet that whistle, I got brand new music right here as we rock out with Death From Above. You might know them formerly as Death From Above 1979 because of a copyright battle. They're actually going to keep all their socials as DFA 1979, but they've dropped the 79 from their name and are just going by Death From Above in return with a brand new single called Freeze Me. There's your Morning Monarchy for Monday, June 12th, 2017, the Geopolitics Edition, my friends. So glad you join us here and take part in a fear-free way at look at what's really going on in the world. We do it without fear, and we do it without advertising. And we do it without hidden agendas, and I'm glad you're here. I appreciate you being here. You can always reach out to me, james, at mediamonarchy.com. We are on the chat on Discord, and we are streaming Monday through Friday, 9 to 5, mediamonarchy.com slash listen. I am super excited about it, and I'm glad you're here. Yeah, there it is. Let's wrap it up. Thank you so much. There's your Morning Monarchy. I'm James Evan Pilato from MediaMonarchy.com. Again, thanking you so much for listening. I can't thank you enough. And as always, reminding you, like Jell B. Offer said, don't hate the media, become the media. Take care. You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Pilato. Since 2005, Media Monarchy has covered the real news about politics, health, technology, and the occult. All remixed with music and media that matters. Go to MediaMonarchy.com slash support and become a monthly subscriber so you can help keep independent, non-commercial, alternative media going and growing. Thanks.